Hello, I'm Stephen Goss, and I'm here to discuss my solo guitar piece, Cinema Paradiso, with Zoran Dukic, who gave the first performance and made the first recording. The piece was commissioned by Guitar Co-op in 2017, and since then Zoran has played it many times. The piece is based on cinema, uh, and each of the six movements is either based on a particular director or a very special film. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Zoran. <laughs> it's uh, great to be here to chat about Cinema Paradiso. Yeah, it's been a long ride with this piece and really full of uh, great ideas and great joys. I've been playing it for quite a while now, always too. Yeah, 2017 was the, was the first performance. In Koblenz, yep, right? In Germany, that's right. And, um, you know, the, start, the idea started quite a long time ago when I was talking with Marcelo Kayat about he wanted to commission a piece from me and we were talking about what could it be about, what could this piece be. And he's a big fan of cinema. I love cinema and you love cinema. So <clears throat> it seemed the perfect sort of topic for a piece to do something that was based on different directors, different films and so on. And very early on he said there had to be something with Charlie Chaplin. That was the very first sort of idea. Yeah, I mean, when I jumped on this train with Cinema Paradiso, I was delighted it's about film. I was always a big movie fan, mainly because of my brother. My brother is a film director, mm. he lives in LA. And uh, when I was growing up, you know, he's four years older, so he was, let's say, 17, 18, he was already in a film club and what's, what not, watching all these weird movies, French, New Wave, and this and that, and Tarkovsky's, and I was a little kid, 12, 13, and I was like, what is this, what is this? And all these big, <laughs> big you know, boys are you know, into this. So I was actually, I remember, when I was about 14, I was escaping from school, mm -hmm. running to, um, rushing to this uh, cinema, kind of cinema museum, which they were showing the old movies, uh, and I saw like, let's say, 10, François Truffaut movies or, uh, you know, uh, all the old kind of uh, series of movies yeah. and I was just skipping school basically. It was right. great because I, in school I would say I had a concert because I was already a bit of a concert player mm -hmm. and in reality I was rushing to a cinema, to movie theater in order to be able to catch up with my brother and his film mm -hmm. crew. Amazing. When I was a student in London, there was a place called The Scala uh, near King's Cross, which used to have these all-night showings. And uh, similarly, it would either be like all the Star Wars films or all the films by Wim Wenders or Last Von Trier. And, uh, you know, it's compulsive stuff. You'd sort of go in after a few beers at 11 p.m. and you'd come out at 6 a.m. having... <laughs> wow, <laughs> and I didn't do that. <laughs> I watched these amazing films. But I, now that you mention uh, Wim Wenders, uh, I saw like maybe seven or eight of his films. Mm. I was maybe even too young to understand everything. But his first mm. experimental movies, one with actually music of Jimi Hendrix and Bob Dylan, and they had a Alice in the Cities and whatnot, all black and white early student works of Wim Wenders. And I just got into it very much. Eh? Yeah, I think one of the biggest problems with sort of pinning down this piece, Cinema Paradiso, was sort of finalizing the sort of six or so films or directors that we'd concentrate on. Difficult. Yeah, right? pretty tricky. To boil it down to only six. Eh? Yeah, and especially as, you know, I had loads of ideas and then you introduced me to loads of new things, new ideas. One of the movements, Mandalay, is based on the film Dogville, which I hadn't even seen. And so you recommended it, and I sort of sat through it, completely devastated by the end. And, uh, and it tied in with so much uh, of the sort of philosophy of, uh, uh, of, of Lars, von, uh, Lars von Trier's films that uh, suddenly it had to go into the piece, you know. Yeah, I remember the first time seeing Dogville, I was, just, I was so impressed. Uh, um, it's just brilliant in so many ways, uh, and philosophically, and the way it was done, even though I mean, it's not original to do it kind of a theater, you know, kind of mm. style. Um, but even the script itself and the story and even name of each character, and with Lorraine Bacall there, she was mm. 90 something. Uh, and uh, as crazy as Lars von Trier is, he's really inspiring <coughs> fellow, right? So, uh, and then again, Dogville was in, inspired by uh, very much by Kurt Weill and yeah, this absolutely. rise and fall of City of Mahagony, which is crazy opera as well, right? Yeah, so all this Somalia and music and this, and I think yeah. it's really... It's, it's really something. So in, in the end, we kind of, we homed in on these six.
I was always very keen right from the beginning to have uh, the last movement as a kind of Tarantino tribute, particularly with sort of Pulp Fiction in mind, uh, which is a kind of classic um, from my own sort of film tastes. It's one I always come back to. I love the fact that the story is told, you know, not in chronological order. The characters are so dark, it's so stylized, so wonderful. Um, I think it's also funny, I bumped into it afterwards, that Tarantino said in one of his interviews that uh, uh, Dogville is one of the best movies ever yeah. made. Eh? So kind of you're closing the circle, we have Tarantino there, but we have also Lars von Trier. But also I love the way that Tarantino uses music in his films. Um, you know, he basically uses his record collection for the soundtrack, and it actually is his record collection. They, take, they took his vinyl into the studio and actually put the needle down, recorded that, and that's what ends up on the film. Um, which is amazing. So it's this kind of highly personalized sort of musical landscape he has for his film. So maybe we should just go through the piece, movement by movement, talk about some of our ideas, collaborations, and some of the unusual techniques which um, I kind of came up with, but most of them you came up with. I kind of set various sort of problems and you came back with incredible solutions. So maybe we should... Well, uh, thank you for saying that, but I mean, the first ideas came from you and you just, the basic inspiration is there and then we just kept building up on that, right? Yeah. Mm. No, for sure. So <clears throat> we start off with Paris, Texas. Um, which is uh, an amazingly impressive film from the 80s, I think 84. Uh, I remember the first time I saw it, I was just kind of completely taken in by the landscapes, the concepts, the characters, the really slow pace of the film. Um, and the fact that, you know, a lot was left unsaid. It was all highly nuanced. And, and sometimes you need to see one shot, which would probably take 200 pages to describe in a novel. You know, and that absolutely brilliant Rai Kuda uh, soundtrack. I can't remember the first time I've seen the film. I know everybody talked about it when it won uh, Cannes, Palme d'Or in Cannes, right? Mm. Um, but Rai Kuder was already the name known in Yugoslavia at that time, you know, and uh, it was a big fuss about that film. Huh? And then I remember, what I remember first about the movie is not the wide shots and slow pace. I remember Nastasia Kinski, actually. Yes. She was really gorgeous <laughs> there and this with her character there and, you yeah. know, with her, you know, eyes semi-scared, semi-gorgeous, yeah. semi-everything, I'm yeah. really telling. Huh? And then Harry Dean Stanton, which is yeah. awesome. But the whole thing, and I think you really created the atmosphere so connected to the film with this mm. kind of long and slow and panoramic thing, as you called it. Him. Yeah, I mean, so I was after that kind of Rai Kuda slide guitar effect. So it was like, how can we use a bottleneck on a modern classical nylon string instrument uh, to have some kind of hint of that uh, wonderful sound world of Rai Kuda? And it was something which I'd sort of tried before, but never really thought it would work. But it was a kind of perseverance job, putting it on the fourth finger and then letting the other fingers play underneath. And the, so there were two kind of musical worlds in my mind for that first movement. The first was this, this idea of the Rai Kuda sound, but the, the second was a track from a Bjork album. Bjork, you told me about it. Yeah, from Vespertine from, I think, 2001, the album. Uh, I mean, it's a really fantastically imaginative album, but it has these sort of moments where there are these sort of like musical mobiles, where there are these sort of pitches which just kind of um, oscillate in the spaces between the kind of vocal lines. Um, so I didn't actually take the, the material itself, but just the idea of these kind of just oscillating bits and then a little bit of beautiful line and then back to these things. And uh, what I love about what you did with the piece was the amount of extra space you put into it. You know, so that, well, I try to get into that mood of this kind of desert, you know, or, you know, long, long shots as in the movie and this, what, 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 what slide or bottleneck does, it does create a totally different sound and you kind of approach it in different 
fashion, the normal <coughs> guitar playing. Mm. For me, it was also lots of experimenting, also with different slides, heavy slides, large ones, metal ones, glass ones, just to try to see what can sound the best. It was actually very tricky, because you can't press too hard, you can't press too soft, you mm. know, uh, otherwise you get horrible noises. Sometimes you have double noises, depends mm. on, you know, so uh, actually some of them I left, or, or, or double pitches, right? Mm. One going upwards, one going downwards, mm. some of that you can hear in the recording, which I mm. find is actually exciting mm. and beautiful. Uh, so it was a huge experience for me, learning now much better, and then also the separation of a pinky, right, of a little finger to try to get and hold the chord there. Mm. It was actually awesome. But this in creation of the mood, I think you really hit it with the, with, the, with, the, with the notes, right? Notes that you composed and picked. Uh, you told me about Björk, but it didn't inspire me. I think it was more inspiration to you. Yeah, to absolutely. me, it was more Ray Kuder and the film itself. Yeah, cool? no, absolutely. But I think one of the other things that I really enjoyed about that movement was tuning the third string down to F sharp. So that meant with the bottleneck, you had these um, two perfect fourths on the top three strings, which is a favorite chord of mine. Uh, and the beautiful thing is you don't use it too often, you use it twice or three times, yeah. just, just enough to get the perfect balance. Yeah. And then of course you've got the F sharp string, so it gives a sort of the D pedal, this kind of wonderful resonance of D, D major, so you've got the low D and the F sharp, and it's, uh, it's a tuning I've used before in um, Watts Chapel. It's a really beautiful resonant tuning. What I was thinking also, because this resonance of a guitar was inspiring me as well, I don't know if one can hear it or something, but also when I was, as I was playing it and searching for sounds, I realized I don't want one sound. I, want, mm. I don't want anything, you know, obnoxiously repetitive, as in some other movements, right? <laughs> but uh, I was really trying to get each sound a different spot on a guitar, boom, mm. bee, boom, in these cross, you know, chords, broken chords and stuff, while slide is doing its own color up there. Yeah. And I think the result is really, really satisfactory. I mean, I think one of the things that is, I think, really important about the collaborative process and about talking to people about how they react to composers' scores and composers' works is that, you know, the very first thing you have to do is do everything that's written, everything that's there, research the composer as much as you can, find out about them. But then what artists do, I mean, like yourself, is that's your kind of baseline from which you then make music really happen, make magic happen. It has to be like that, right? Yeah, it's always like that it's, in well, any kind it, of music. It, I yeah. mean, this is the thing, is, is that, that becomes just a sort of springboard for the kind of magic the performer does. Um, you know, and I think people actually, in a, in a, on the whole, have too much respect for the composer and the composer's score, because the composer is just part of the chain, the food chain. It's like, right, see what you can do with this, rather than this is my precious piece, you must play it like I say. You're opening up a subject which we can talk about for two hours. In well, the, this you know, is true. We'll just, we'll just leave it yes, there for uh, now. But the, what I often say is, as joke or semi-jokers mm. to my students, you know, say, oh, don't worry about what composer thinks. They yeah. have no idea. They just made a piece and mm. you now play it, right? It's yours. Absolutely right. I mean, you it's, know? Um, you know, I, I would much rather hear six completely different interpretations of a piece than say to everyone, oh, there's this one right way of doing it. Yeah. And you show new things, you know. Um, no, Actually, like, even recently, I was just with Dusan Bogdanovich, who is yeah. one of my really favorite composers yeah, yeah. and stuff, and I'm playing one of his pieces, a uh, new one in my repertoire, and he heard the recording and said, what are you doing this? I said, well, Dusan, you don't know how this should be done. You just composed the piece. <laughs> <laughs> how did he take it? He, la he laughed, he laughed. He said, yeah. okay. <laughs> I know, I mean, some composers are very fussy. Now, I'm not speaking for all composers, but that's certainly... Um... Yeah, you definitely meet them. I, I, I remember, I don't know, Steve Reich, for example, he was just so fussy about it. You know, it's yeah. just to be exactly where it is. It's, 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 you kind of lose, lose the human part of interpretation. What do you need to do? You need to... Yeah. But, I mean, there are certain them. composers whose music, it does have that kind of non-human non aspect. I mean, you could argue that his does. It's, it has yeah. this kind of mechanical, machine-like yeah. machine uh, 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 precision to it. Um, which sort of brings us nicely on to modern times. The Charlie Chaplin film, the second movement in this piece, which, uh, you know, going back to Marcelo, that was the first scene. He even had this particular scene from modern times in mind when we, when we discussed the piece very early on, where Charlie Chaplin is working on a production line. The production line starts 
begins to move faster and faster. He can't really keep up. There's various sort of comic events that happen until eventually he gets swallowed up by, uh, by the machine. And then you sort of see him being sort of cogged around this sort of machine until eventually the machine spews him out again at the other end. And so the second movement of, of Cinema Paradiso is basically this scene choreographed almost like film music moment by moment um, with, you know, with different shots in mind, different machines in mind with the kind of material. And uh, perhaps it's a good point to read what I wrote at the beginning of the score of this movement, which uh, is hard, mechanical and deeply unmusical. <laughs> <laughs> I think we talked about the deeply musical at the time, right? Yes. It's tricky eh, to come, yeah. become suddenly mechanical. For example, I love to move when I play. You know, I yeah. move a lot. I use my body. I, I think mm. music is movement and body moves with the music always. So I was really had to practice to, uh, not to move while I play that you know, mm. first mechanical section, mm. right? And later on, you have, you have marvelous descriptions, right? Or character markings, right? I mean, you have red hot, you know, to yes. imagine during the top deep, that red hot and you know, hard and what, uh, different kind of approach. So, you know, you always try to find musicality. This is, no, no, deeply unmusical. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, one of the things I was trying to do with this, this suite of pieces is to have as many contrasts as possible, to have you know, each one a totally different world from the next, in the same way that a director will find a particular world for a film, um, which might be different from the next film they direct or might be different from you know, another director's work. So I think with, with modern times, it was to kind of get into this sort of early modernist kind of um, mechanistic world of sort of clockwork and cogs and, you know, early early electronic stuff, that kind of world, and those colors and those uh, um, imperfections. Uh, so, you know, the sound has to be ugly, has to be machine-like. I, I think also it's, it's, the, uh, it's the only one of the, of the six movements which kind of I can see as a programmatic, right, to be ra right mm. descript descriptive of that particular scene. I do try to run it in my head, especially in some moments, you know, as when I have this repetitive thing on top at very high yes. notes, when the machine is actually getting really blocked and stopping slow. Uh, 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 I try to kind of mm. revive that there and then restarting. So I have this really clear script in my head when I perform it, right? This one is kind of like going like a clock tuck, 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 or like a machine. Tuck, 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 mm. tuck, tuck, and then we kind of there is a story there. So how unmusical it is, I don't know. Maybe it's just different approach to musicality. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that one comes in as a, as a fast, contrasted, hard edge thing, and it's, it's kind of over. And then we move into the third movement. I mean, uh, I'm always changing which is my favorite movement, but the third movement I like a lot, uh, which is simply called Noir. Um, and it's based around that kind of uh, street jazz of, of film noir, that really kind of dark, the sort of idea of someone in a hat smoking a cigarette on a street corner. There's sort of smoke, there's steam. There's this kind of saxophone solo in the background. It's just it's this whole world, which is kind of the, you know, the detective story from the fifties that, um, that that brings all these images to mind. Or uh, maybe a double bass in that section. Yeah. I also imagine double bass from the background. Five a.m. Some odd, you know, love story. Some odd crime story. Everything's mm. mixing up. There's a smoke. I mean, perfect example is the. Elevator to the Gallows, yeah. right, with uh, Miles Davis's music. So mm -hmm. I think that's kind of, you know, bl black and white. I mean, his uh, soundtrack is just phenomenal, right? Yeah. And he did it in one session, I think. Yeah, right? just like, right? yeah. Um, 
But also the whole, you know, this kind of French, you know, style of movies in the 50s, mm. it's, it's really, uh, you know, evoking that to me. Yeah. And then my own personal approach to it, right? And with the jazzy chords and some kind of sort of, a, you know, jazz standard music, but it's not really there. It's all kind of melting down. Yeah, it's and, kind of you know, distorted, a bit like, you know, yeah. the, the clocks in Dali painting. Or and again, your character marking was, I think, sleazy. Sleazy, yeah. Sleazy. So I'm trying to do that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's, um, you know, I was off. You wrote something of, else, I think. Sleazy and... Um, yeah, but there was I this, there was this no. sort of jazz double bass sound I was after, yeah, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, with the slow, wide vibrato. Um, not only dark you, and sleazy, yeah. Dark and sleazy. Yeah, slow and free. Yeah. yeah, so... I try to. So I try to actually get a color, this yes, double, double yeah. bass. I play with the side of my finger. I yeah. even lift my guitar a little bit. Yeah. Anyway, in my mind, it's close to that. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, it, was, uh, it's, it's what, it was very magical. It's the kind of... Uh, I mean, one of the things I, I kind of obsess about is this uh, always striving to find new colors or something that has just a slightly different shade or something that's very unusual. And I also did, I remember in that moment also what I did uh, uh, in the very beginning, for the, for the, already for the premiere, I play a couple of chords with total side of my thumb, so I kind of accidentally catch the edge of the nail, so I got this dirty kind of yeah. almost metallic chord, yeah? and I think it sounds jazzy again It does, to me, well, yeah? and also it's, it's a kind of um, almost a cliche sharp nine chord uh, uh, each time, so it's, uh, uh, it's, it's one that is basically, it's, you know, and, and relates to Jimi Hendrix too, that kind yeah. of thing, but it's, yeah. it's all these sort of jazz chords which are slightly distorted, you know, one semitone moved, another note added, and so on, so it, it's a kind of interesting sort of harmonic world. Uh, I enjoyed enjoyed that very much. Um, you have a couple of chords which are really uncomfortable up there, about yes. you know the fourteenth position stretched for six frets. You know, it's yeah. like really tricky. Really good, but with, yeah. with good preparation, it works really well. Huh? I think I think in the score you put an option yes. for players with less flexible hand yeah. with one note out. Huh? But yeah, I, I mean it's it's interesting. It's, it's always I mean you know the guitar fingerboard fretboard is so um, well covered in terms of the human hand. The, the curious thing I think about being a guitarist oneself is that uh, it's very easy to just write music which is very grateful to the hand. Whereas in fact, what you're always thinking is like, well, which notes on which strings haven't been combined together in a chord? Is there a voicing that is totally unknown? How can I get this voicing? And you, then you think and of the And you voicing. really do it. So in a couple of, I mean, there's two things I uh, also did which don't appear in the other movements. Once I had to play with the nose at one point because yeah. I had all the fingers busy and right hand in her morning, so just nose was the only extremity free to play <laughs> the note. And um, another thing, what I did also in one point is because I had everything busy with one chord and then I had to play the F on the 13th fret mm -hmm. with the right hand, pressing with first finger or index I mm -hmm. and then plucking it with A in decorative mm -hmm. pom, pom, just before yeah. double bass starts. Huh? So I had to really, I knew what more or less what you imagined. I really had to kind of be inventive to, to try to find a way to, to, to recreate that. I think one of the sort of paradoxes about sort of film noir soundtracks is that the film itself is highly monochrome, and yet the soundtrack is often incredibly colourful and full of tumbral nuance and, and the rest of it. And I think the thing with that movement was to try and find uh, very unfamiliar sounds mm. on the guitar, the kinds of vibrato that are not really appropriate in any other sort of piece, unless you're deliberately trying to imitate something. Like and also you have street, uh, string bendings as well, yeah. and quite... Uh, uh, I think it sounds really as a character marking. I try mm. to make it you know, sleazy, slow, smoky. You yeah. know, for example, I was really trying to find a way how to do it. As opposed, not as opposed, uh, in comparison with the first movement, mm. where I was kind of studying or trying to copy Ray Kuder's vibrato with his slide, mm. you know, because slide, depending on the slide, if slide is heavier, there's more vibrato, if slide is uh, lighter, then there's less vibrato, you know, depends on the way. But anyway, I could not get that uh, metal string 
metal slide vibrato mm. on a classical guitar. Mm. So I had to find my own way of getting it because mm. we can get less, no, it is shorter, you know, but I was really working hard to try to find how much and where I can use vibrato in mm. this. Whereas in this bending, in the third movement, yeah. I can do a bit more and really make a note kind of open and close and make it kind of melting down. Huh? I think really. No, that's amazing. I mean, in the score, I just was, was writing pre bends with particular notes and little slides down. But what you came up with was something like a, it was a whole new world of basically microtonal expression mm. through pushing, pulling, vibrato. And, uh, and so it was, yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons I think of that as my favorite movement is because of how you make it sound. You know, in terms of these these extra colors and these things, and when you're writing it, you kind of dream of how it might sound, and then when you hear it, and it's kind of way better than you thought it could possibly be. Thanks. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I enjoy it very much as well. But to me, favorite movements. I mean, I play it now for what four years, right? Mm. The piece it changes all the time. One year yeah. is this one, one year is that one. You know. Yeah, so yeah I mean, this they're is all a, great. This uh, is another another thing about interpretation. I think is that people. You know, often we'll, we'll, we'll sort of settle on a particular tempo, particular interpretation, particular articulations. But I think, you know, a lot of great artists, um, you know, several pianists I can think of in particular, will play a piece differently every time. They'll have so many tempi, so many articulations, so many ways of doing it at their fingertips that they're kind of improvising on the night which way they're going to do it. Um, and I certainly feel that's the way that you've been working with some of these movements. That It's true. They know, change, they evolve. But all the... Uh, they do change, they do evolve, but also, as you say, it depends on the space, if it's you know, and, and where you play. You know, it's, uh, acoustic depends on your mood. I, I, I would say that I am a spontaneous player, so I always mm. change stuff. And mm. you know, next time I don't know what I did then, and mm. who knows what I'm going to do tomorrow. You know, and uh, it always depends on the moment. Uh, I think I can't repeat the same thing twice. There's no yeah. way. You know, it's always very human, very at the moment experience. Any performance. And I don't try, I don't intend to. I know the players also, uh, a part of those pianists, I know some other pianists who try really to make it perfect and play the same every time, yeah. and they're marvelous and everything, yeah. but I could just could not function like that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think from a, um, from a composer's point of view, just hearing, you know, uh, your piece, I was like, like it's a mobile, it's going around like this, and every time you hear it, they're shining a new light and it's showing a new angle to it. I mean, I love that. Um, so the next piece is an interesting one, the uh, uh, Mandalay. Mandalay, yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, the, the Kurt Weill uh, connection is really important, actually. I think I'm a, a, a huge Kurt Weill fan, and particularly this, you know, before he went to the States, the work he did with Bertolt Brecht. Uh, we've mentioned the rise and fall of the city of Mahagoni. Also, obviously, Thrupp and the Opera is in there. Um, you know, the Berlin Requiem, um, Seven Deadly Sins, all that uh, sort of Berlin-based stuff. And that sound world that's that's very special. I know. And with your quartet, you used to play also some good well pieces. Right? We before, certainly did. Yeah, yeah we did um, uh, Thrupping Opera for yeah, years. Yeah, I know. And now with my quartet, European Guitar Quartet, we, we played some of your arrangements. Plus, also, I arranged, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, um, the Whiskey. Oh, yes. Show song. me the wax and next yeah. whiskey bar. The whiskey yeah. bar um, from Mahagoni. Yeah. I yeah, I also I, I, I'm I'm a good Weil fan for a long time. So this was really I think when I play this movement, the fourth one, uh, Lars von Trier in a way disappears and Kurt Weil takes so yeah, much I more. So. Huh? Well, I very much had the Kurt Weil sound world yeah. in my head again, a bit like in um, Noir when I was taking some jazz harmonies and distorting them in uh, Mandalay. They're kind of Kurt Weil chords. With a few twisted notes. Yes, yes. Indeed. And but in particular, that very direct four-four rhythm of you know um cha cha um cha um, with dissonances cha -cha, inside cha -cha. and powerful yeah, and absolutely. kind of and and, and decadent, they're kind of yeah decadent, decadent and thing. quite an ugly sound. You know, a deliberately yeah. kind of um, provocative, uh, ugly sound, which is which is very kind of appealing. And I think in that movement, just exploring that kind of dirty world, a world where you wouldn't really want to go, you wouldn't want to sort of uh, find it's the kind of thing you'd like to see from a distance. 
I mean, one of the things that I found uh, completely compelling about the Dogville film is that even though it's 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 made in quite a kind of um, distancing way, it's not that realistic. They've drawn out the shapes of the rooms on the floor with chalk. You you get very drawn into it very quickly, and you get very close to the characters very quickly. And then what happens to them, without giving too much away, is devastating because you're so invested in those characters and you have no idea what's coming. And when it does come, it's absolutely shocking. Um, and I think it was that kind of, oh my God, aspect that I wanted to try and get some aspect of in, in the piece. And you actually, by the time, uh, uh, given the events, you forget that they actually that the, the spaces were drawn with the chalkboard yeah. and you know you think it's become so real. Huh? Huh? Yeah. So uh, these uh, external elements disappear huh? totally. Yeah. Huh? Absolutely. So then we, we're kind of in this Kurt Weill world. Uh, and then a after huge that, change. It's a again. huge change. I mean, again. But then the next change is, is 451, the next movement. Uh, which, before we talk about it in any detail, I should say that I originally drafted a completely different movement for 451, um, which I still have somewhere. <clears throat> but I drafted it before I'd written some of the other movements. And when I'd had those, when those first four were there, it was definitely time for a palate cleanser. There had to be something that was suddenly quiet, still, and sort of tonal, and just so everyone could just breathe, especially after the intensity of noir and Mandalay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I remember. I remember you said you had a draft, but then suddenly you had a, you know, new vision, and this, mm. as you call it, palate cleanser, and that's exactly what it is. But it's actually much more than that as well. So yeah. many new ideas, really, and these are this movement, even though it's simple choral based on four five one. Yeah. Uh, in many ways. In many ways, uh, yes. I mean, it's. Um, I suppose before we get too into it, I should say that um, I constructed the piece in a very. Um, a formalized way. So, you know, four, five, one, there are four chords in the first phrase, then five chords, then one chord. Then I do it again, but I take one chord away. So it's three, four, one, then two, three, one, then one, two, one, and then build it up again. Two, three, one, three, four, one, and finishes with four, five, one. So that, that's the shape. So then I had to, you know, come up with a, a chorale that sort of fitted that. And it was a really interesting challenge to make each phrase seem the right length, even though the length was already prescribed. And, and you had other limitations, let's say, being mm. tonal, there's no accidentals. Yep, and, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Having a sort of classical cadence, you know, yeah. the, the subdominant, dominant, tonic. It's absolutely gorgeous. Then the new ideas came, so many for that piece, right? Oh, it was crazy. I mean, yeah, so yeah, yeah. for a start, I mean, just to say Fahrenheit 451, originally a novel by Ray Bradbury. Um, the film in question was the first Fahrenheit 451 film uh, made by Francois Truffaut in 1966. Uh, absolutely incredible film, really caught my imagination. So we're in a dystopian future where reading is banned. Uh, the society are controlled by the government and reading is considered dangerous. <coughs> and if anyone is found with a book, they're arrested and all books are burned. So the firemen, instead of putting out fires, go around the fireproof houses burning books. It's impressive. I remember still, uh, I was 14 maybe when I saw it the first time. Mm. I remember those piles of books being burned by these mean police officers in weird uniforms, you know, or firemen or whatever they were mm. in this uh, horrible fascistoid country. I didn't understand anything. And then I remember also then 
one of the scenes in the woods, people hiding and reading, teaching each other like the, all these books, mm. you know, by heart to save the world's literature, you know, so mm. grandparents teaching grandchildren, Dostoevsky, you know, and I was it just all took my, I was really young. Mm. I think if I read it later, maybe it wouldn't impact me so much, but those, those visions always were uh, really deep embedded in my mind. Mm. And then when you came up with this, I thought it was brilliant. And I, you know, I, I, I was, as I said, escaping to see three false movies when I was a kid, right? And uh, it was ideal. And then the idea came, you know, that just suddenly appeared that, why, you know, if they can learn Dostoevsky and Shakespeare's by heart, why wouldn't be, we be able to kind of um, do the same thing with the music? So actually, you know, to orally or auditory way teach our fellow humans mm. the same music, right? Mm. So the idea came actually not to print the score, right? That's correct. Yeah, so, I mean, the whole in the whole world is not a printed word anywhere. And so, as Zoran describes, these book people uh, lived outside society. Each one would memorize a book and be able to speak it to someone else so they could hear the book. Uh, and then when people were getting very old, they were going to die, they had to teach it to someone else so they could carry the book on forward. So people became, you know, the brothers Karamazov, or, or look yes. over there, there's, there's Romeo and Juliet by, yes, yes. by Shakespeare, and so on. And of course, you know, one of the big issues, I think, with, with classical music is that we're so obsessed with the score. And this, uh, this idea of the oral tradition of passing music down by ear is kind of lost in our, in our world. The score becomes everything. So yeah, you had this crazy idea. It was your idea, actually. Uh, is that actually we should just burn the score and there not be a score. Exactly. And, and the piece can only be passed down by someone teaching it or yep. by someone taking it off the video or the record. Yes. Um, you even did a lesson on the piece for, uh, I did, for yeah, an educational so, platform yeah. to show people how to play the piece. Yeah, um, and uh, when score was published, you know, and people get surprised, they kind of go, go through and they see the empty page, yeah. they get kind of surprised. Hey, I want to learn this piece. And it's also, you, you compose it in such a beautiful way Right, but all they get is a really empty, empty score with just a title. And then there were so many jokes. We were just bursting oh. with ideas, both of us, right? You know, it's a fifth movement and it says four, five, one. And then uh, uh, metronomic marking is white note 45 to 51. And then page, because accidentally happened between, uh, you know, page 13 and 15, but we didn't leave it at 14, it's 14.5, the page, right? And even the editor, Doberman, they came up, they kind of joined in the idea, so the, this is a fake number, but they call it 1154 is the edition number. And then most amazing thing happened, actually a couple of them, but one of, one of those was when I was shooting that uh, educational video for Tone Base, three years ago or so, and so the guy's setting up mics, and I ask him, what mics do you have? And I'm just trying the chords, I just did that, uh, that movement, uh, and he said, I have, I forgot which one, Neumann or whatever, 451. I said, what? <laughs> it cannot be the number of mics is fitting, the number of mics is fitting perfectly the number of this. Uh. Not to mention your birthday. Yeah, so the, the incredible coincidence was, which I didn't think of for a while, was that my birthday, which is on the 4th of May, Easy to remember, May the 4th be with you, as they use now. Uh, so first three numbers, four, five, one, is mm. in my birthday. So, so many coincidences with this piece. And another really uh, great experience for me was, even though there's no score here, you know, but it's uh, basically a succession of chords, as you described the, uh, the form now as well, but it's just, uh, you know, four or five, sometimes one note. Um, as well, based on the number, on the title. And uh, you told me not to arpeggi arpeggiate. Huh? Mm. And that was tricky, because you know, you try to always be expressive with mm. the chords on a guitar to hear them all. He said, no, 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 I want everything to, I, w I don't want pitches to be recognized so simply, right? Yeah. And I really had to work hard. In the end, I found the way of doing it, even though in the recording I squeezed in only one arpeggio, in that I see as a Morricone kind of uh, uh, progression uh, phrase. So I do have one arpeggio. Huh? I'm sorry about that, but I, I love it. I do, I do it again. 
Well, we kind of agreed it, didn't we? Negotiated that one, I think. Yes, yes, yeah. And, uh, but also what you said is that you wanted to, to balance and to have the top knot a little bit out, which, you know, I, 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 I strive to do. And I think it came out well, because there is beautiful melodic line, even mm -hmm. though it's not a pure melody, it's just a harmonic choral thing mm -hmm. happening. Uh, but there is always this guidance, direction, while I'm playing it, uh, even though it's very slow and spacious, mm -hmm. you know, I keep hearing those notes long and connecting them with my A finger at all mm -hmm. times. Beautiful, beautiful movement. Um, how many people have I had contacting me in the last four years wanting to learn the piece? Well, a number of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say about 20, you know, so, you know, I think uh, it's good. Yeah, I mean, also my poor publishers had lots of complaints. I, yeah, 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 I heard you know, about this that. Is, this also. is uh, people find my score is faulty for some reason. The music's not. There's on this nothing page. on the page. Yeah, <laughs> nothing on the page. I know. I only bought it for this one movement, and it's not there. And I had one student send me the written score, you know, oh. uh, with the mistakes, but great. So I was wondering, you know, if, uh, if, for example, I stop playing or I die, you know, and somebody learn it and then he passes it on to the next somebody else and then he dies and passes it to the next one. What would happen in, to the piece in five, six generations? Well, this is it. I mean, even even with one generation, you know. You know, because be, we don't have a score. There's we don't, no bar but we, lines. But people go by the we feeling. Don't, it would, we don't have a score, but we have a recording. We have a video. Yeah. So people you know, can hear and see you playing. I don't, I don't suppose uh, digital media is going to disappear that soon. Yeah, uh, uh, um, and so uh, they just simply have to learn it from that, you know. And if they learn it with mistakes, that's fine. Yeah, that's you know? fine. Just and the, the piece evolves, has a life keeps of its evolving, own. Yeah. You know? Exactly, you know. Yeah. And uh, I mean, one of the things also about the film, the Truffaut film, was a fantastic score by Bernard Herrmann, which was, um, it was just percussion and strings. And it had this, you know, the sound world was, was kind of built for this uh, this dystopian future. But they were dense, dense strings, uh, quite dense, no, I think. Yeah, uh, very yeah, much yeah, so, yeah. Dense sounding, rich. Yeah, and, absolutely. So it was... Yeah. Um, anyway, for you to see, it looks beautiful, I think. And then we come to the final movement. We do, Tarantino. Which, Tarantino. Which is this kind of terrible pun uh, when I first thought of it, you know, what you call a small Tarantella. A Tarantino, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and so uh, so it's a Tarantello, but um, the idea here is that instead of a spider biting you, it's uh, it's a heroin needle. Um, uh, thinking of that scene in Pulp Fiction where uh, Uma Thurman gets uh, uh, sort of passes out and nearly nearly dies after a heroin overdose, so it's a very dark place. This this last movement, and it's um, yeah, Pulp Fiction made an enormous impression on me at the time when I first saw it when it first came out. It was like Okay, so cinema now is something different. Yeah, well, as we know, that Tarantella is this this Italian dance where supposedly after you're bitten by a poisonous spider, tarantula, you go and dance in crazy whirling dance until you recover, right? So it's kind of nuts to start with Tarantella, and then Tarantino uh, is the same thing. And what you wrote here in the, in the end, right, go totally out of your mind. I didn't write out of your mind, but uh, out of control, completely out of control, inaccurate, buzzy. I had to practice to be buzzy, yeah. actually, which is not difficult <laughs> on the guitar, you know, but noisy. So it really goes, grows into something totally wild and out of control. And actually, when I was making a CD, I, in the last take, I totally broke my nail, which was really strong. Uh, it just flew away and I had to stop recording, but I was done, right? Uh, so it starts kind of tempo di tarantella, you know, like but then it, it you know morphs into something completely different and wild, and uh, I think it leaves great impression. I love playing it. It does take lots of energy. I usually really end up sweaty, mm. you know, and uh, I keep it for the end of the programs because after that, where do you go, you know, uh, right. after Tarantino? But it's an awesome, wild, aggressive bloody, you know, movement, full of imagination, same like Tarantino's movies, yeah? They're kind of all simple, but wild and crazy.
I love this thing you did with the, with the bass line, which is totally out of tune with these vibratos up and down. Yeah, yeah again, I, ha I had to come up with a couple of, couple of uh, new ideas how to play some things, because mm. you go very high to the, yes. you know, the 16th fret, and I have to really uh, do uh, lots of... And then we changed something. At some point, I couldn't get it, so we, we did change a few notes. Yeah, well, there was, I wanted a lot of this kind of string bending stuff very high up on the, on the 6th string, the D string, because it's very, very bendy around those frets. Around 12 frets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, you can't then do the bending while playing other notes at the same time. So, what I had to do was kind of um, make it so that there was a chance for the notes to do its full bending and then the other accompaniment picked up again. Yeah, I remember we moved this. some some from this high, we moved it onto the fifth string. I just yeah. could not get it sound yeah. proper. But you also have some on the third string. And in a really short span of time, because it's yeah. fast. As I'm doing it, I'm already getting myself in an aggressive kind of state, you know? <laughs> so it kind of brings me slowly to the, you know, naturally towards the out of control final. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things about this movement is, uh, you know, I had your playing in mind, I imagined you on stage playing it. I imagined writing things that would, uh, well, both annoy and excite you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be uh, kind of impossible, but then a sort of challenge and sort of see what happens. And in fact, I remember after the first performance, we both felt um, that it wasn't quite the ending that we needed. It wasn't quite there yet. And then you reinforced it, yeah. Uh, re yeah. I rewrote the ending later. Uh, yeah. uh, it's just something I often do with pieces is that, you know, you learn so much when you hear a piece all the way through for the first time in an audience in real time in an audience. Suddenly the amount of information that comes into your brain is enormous. That's why it's uh, so easy to be a critic because it's, you sit in the audience, you can hear everything. So as a composer, of course, you hear your piece and you instantly can see what needs to change or what needs yes, to be adapted yes, yes, yes. in the first performance. So uh, that's why I never publish a piece before the first performance. <laughs> <laughs> there are always changes. And certainly with the last one and, uh, and also Marcelo Kaya from, from um, from guitar co-op also sort of said, you know, you know, it's all great, but we have, you have to do an even But don't you thing. find it's the same thing with the performance, you know, the first time I play it, and then you see how it works, how you yeah. work, how everything functions in real space with yeah. the audience, yeah. and then you change, you see, you adapt, you see, no, this has to be this way, because yeah. one thing is what you imagine at home, but the phrasing, the other thing is in the real yeah. life. And that's why I'd say also never record a piece immediately before playing it in the concerts, you know? Yeah. Obviously, they like to live with you for a while because it's going to grow with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is something that happens, you know, with pieces over several performances, is that the performer sort of takes them on their own journey. Um, and when I've been fortunate enough for people to play my pieces a lot, you know, what they become at the end is so far removed from where they started, but they're enhanced, you know, in a good way. They become much... Uh, much stronger, much more interesting than they were before. I, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I played Cinema Paradiso uh, many times in the last four years, many, many times in most of my concerts with a pandemic break of a year and a half almost. Even though I squeezed it a few times in there as well, <laughs> I think once or twice in those year and a half. But a lot and uh, reaction is always so positive. And it's really funny how some people uh, uh, love this movement the most, mm -hmm. some the other movement the most. I must say Chaplin always gets, Charlie Chaplin Martin Times always gets the most comments, but uh, there's always somebody else who likes different kind mm. of I think there's something for everybody there. Uh, it's a marvelous piece, I think, really. Well, thank you. Chapeau. <laughs> Thanks so much. How's my hair? <laughs> yeah. This is all about the hair. This is true. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs>